So we are continuing our theme our, of running well because we want to finish well. And I thought about changing the name of the series right now because we're really studying the walls and gates of Nehemiah. But everything in this book is about us running well and finishing well. So everything in here. So any passage of scripture we want to go to would fit running and finishing well. We have started looking at the walls and gates uh, in Nehemiah's time. And I'm reminding you this is only in Nehemiah's time because the walls and their names and locations have actually changed in modern day Jerusalem. So we're going clear back to 445 BC during the time of Nehemiah. We have had two lessons on the sheep gate. And so now we think we're ready to go to gate number two. But... If we look down that wall and if we look in chapter 3 of Nehemiah, before we ever can get to gate 2, there are two towers of fortification that we must have in our life before we go on to gate 2. So today we're going to look at these towers. And this is pretty new information because I just kind of glazed over those uh, two towers the first time I did this about eight years ago. So we're going to dig a little bit more into the towers of fortification. Now, if you remember from lesson number one, we know that in Nehemiah's time in chapter three, he lists 10 different gates for us. We've divided them into several categories, and these first three gates are called priority. These gates have to be in place in our lives before we move on to the rest of the gates. It's the sheep gate, the fish gate, and the old gate. And so we're, we're establishing those in our lives, getting them in place so we can restore everything else effectively. I had given you a map a couple of weeks ago, and I have it up here. And we noticed that everything, where does our journey begin? At the sheep gate, where does it end? At the sheep gate, because we start with Jesus Christ, and we're going to end with him the inspection gate, the judgment seat of Christ, our whole journey starts with Jesus and we go all the way around in a counterclockwise direction and we end up standing before Jesus Christ. So uh, we're going to come full circle. Remember the specific thing about the sheep gate that's different from the others. There are no bars and there's no locks on it. And the reason is because the way of salvation is always open. It's always open. Uh, it tells us in uh, Romans 10, 13, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it tells us in John 1, 9, that God puts light on every man that comes into the world. So I believe light is shed, whether people respond or not. You know, uh, God knows who is going to respond and who is not. Now, but it's always available to the sinner. We're going to start in Jeremiah 31 today, verse 38, with a prophecy from Jeremiah. And he says, The days are coming, declares the Lord God. This city, what city? Jerusalem. It will be rebuilt for me from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. So that tower is very important. And we will see that 150 years later, that prophecy is now going to be fulfilled when we go to Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 1. Eliashib, who is our what? He's the high priest, so he's a type of Jesus Christ, who is our high priest. He rose up with his brethren, the priest, and they built the sheep gate. Notice they sanctified it. They set up the doors of it even to the Tower of Mia, which is also called the Tower of the Hundred. And look, they're going to go clear to the Tower of Hananel, which was mentioned in Jeremiah's prophecy. So we have these two towers that are going to be in view. Now, if you look up here, you see that in the upper right corner is a picture of the Sheep Gate. You should recognize it. Now, when I apply the blood of Jesus Christ, because he is the good shepherd, right? He's the lamb that took away the sin of the world and shed his blood. And so every time the sheep went in, because there were millions of sheep that were sacrificed. So every time a sheep went in, we know it went in that door of the sheep gate, and it went to the altar, and it was 
consumed, right? It was offered as a burnt offering, and that poor little sheep gave its life, but it never got to come out. We've talked about this. You and I, when we accept Jesus Christ, do we become one of his sheep? Yes, but we go in and we lay ourselves on the altar of burnt offering. We're supposed to offer ourselves that living sacrifice, but you and I get to come up and we get to come out because we have a new life, but it's the life of Jesus Christ that's supposed to be lived in us, right? So I'm starting my journey. This is where I start at the sheep gate. And I'm starting my pilgrim journey. And you notice I've uh, enhanced uh, just the top of the map and we come from the sheep gate, and we have two towers in our way before we ever get to the fish gate. So we're going to stop and look at these two and see why they're there in this position. Now here's a picture of a city that has these towers on each side of a gate. They're part of the defense system. Are you and I now God's dwelling place? Yes. So the, they were close to the citadel where the soldiers were guarding the temple. Is the temple where God dwelt, his presence? Yes. So you have to have towers of fortification close to God's dwelling place. Now, this became so interesting to me because I never realized it. There's two towers, and what side of Jerusalem are we on? The north. That's important for you to remember. We have two towers on the north wall. If you look at Jerusalem, on three sides, it is very steep. And there's mountains and valleys and mountain and valley to the east, west, and south. And so that's pretty good defense in itself, right? But on the north, out here by the Sheep Gate, it's flat. It's relatively flat. That's where the enemy always came in and would provide destruction upon the city of Jerusalem. That's where the Assyrians came in. It's also where Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came in. So the north is very vulnerable, but that's where I start my journey with Christ. Am I pretty vulnerable? Who's going to be after me? Satan, the enemy. That's why it's so important to get these towers in place. So we're protected against the enemy. Now, I've got a green arrow at the top of the screen showing you that the enemy always comes from the north. Because the land is flat, it's easy for them to get in and cause destruction. And that's what happened many times in Jerusalem's history. Now, this made me think of those passages that warn us about our enemy. In 1 Peter, he says, you're to be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is walking about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and you need to resist him. So in your mind, you picture you started your journey, and you're on that north wall, back there, that's the north, and who is right out there ready to attack you? Satan, the enemy. Okay. Now, the other scripture says in John 10, 10, there's a thief out there that came to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's out there. In the Hebrew, they talk about the term out of the north, and it means hidden. He's hidden out of the north. So, now this is also, I, I just found so many uh, things that just thrilled me. I hope they thrill you as much. Next to Eliashib, he's building the sheep gate, right? Okay, he's the high priest. Okay, so right next to him are the men of Jericho. The men of Jericho were the ones, their city had a curse on it, remember? And God said, you can never build that city again, there's a curse. So the people that had the curse are right next to the high priest. And so they are allowed, who took the curse for us? Jesus Christ. He bore our curse. So we have the one representing Jesus Christ, and right next to him are the people that bore the curse, that had the curse on them. Now, next to him were Zachur and then the son of Emery built. And if you notice in chapter 3, it says, it goes on and on, and we talked about this last week. It lists a man's name, and next to him was this person, and next to him was this person, and after him. You know, it's this dry genealogy thing uh, that we sometimes want to skip over. But we, we found out God records names, right? And he shows us that in this chapter. Now, the word tower, 
See, we've got two towers that have to get established. The word tower is from the Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew word megdal, and it's derived from the word gadal, and it means grow. What am I supposed to do after I become born again? Start growing. And that's what the word tower means in Hebrew, these towers of fortification. And now Jericho, who had the curse on them, they're right by the high priest building, which I think is just, that's not a coincidence. And so Jericho means fragrance. Now, I'm supposed to be growing. And look at the words here, the people that were building right there. Fragrant, walking by faith. Next to him was Zakur, and it means remembrance, keep bringing to my mind. Don't we always need to remember what Christ did for us? And then he was, and then Emory was next, and it means utter or to exalt. So after I had been born again, Jesus bore my curse, right? Now I'm supposed to be growing. I am walking by faith. Uh, my wall becomes a fragrance to him. I'm remembering all the time what Jesus did for me, and I'm telling other people about it and exalting his name. Now that's what all that means is you're growing. Now isn't that cool? Yeah, okay. Y'all don't have to agree with me if you don't think so. <laughs> because I'm going to think it's cool no matter what. So here we are, and we get to the tower of Hananel. And if you notice, it's part way down your wall, almost to the second gate. And we have the tower of Hananel, and that was the one that was prophesied that it will be rebuilt down to the tower of Hananel and then onto the corner. And uh, Hananel means God is gracious. <laughs> and I'm receiving God's favor when I'm growing and my walk is like it's supposed to be God's favor receive and he's gracious now this is a very significant tower because god had prophesied through jeremiah the prophet it will be erected again and that tower means why because god is gracious and because it will he re, the people will receive god's favor now so this was not an ordinary construction site hey let's just put this tower out here no it was an act of dedication to god and they were fulfilling prophecy when they actually built that tower because God had ordained that that tower would be rebuilt. And it's mentioned specifically in Jeremiah's prophecy. It happened 150 years later. Really neat. Now, in God's plan for redemption, Jesus Christ, and this was, this was set up before the foundation of the world, right? Okay. Jesus Christ was going to offer himself in absolute submission to the Father's will. We go to Philippians, and it says that he humbled himself, and he even was obedient to death, even the death of the cross, right? Now, let's put God's plan for sanctification. That's for you and me, right? Now, does he want absolute submission from us to his will? Yes. And are we to humble ourselves before him? Are we to be obedient to the point of death to our old man and death to ourself, our passion, and the works of the flesh? Same thing. Is Christ the example? Yes. And we are to follow. So in Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves, what? a living sacrifice that will be holy and acceptable unto God, it's only our reasonable service. Look at the very beginning of that. I beseech you how? The mercies of God. He's been going on in Romans telling them all about God's mercy, and he's no condemnation to those that, that believe in him, and he has brought them to this wonderful place. Do you see the mercies of God on you? Now, therefore, you offer yourself. That's only your reasonable service. And he says, and you're not to be conformed to this world. I want you to be transformed. How? By renewing your mind. This is what will renew my mind. This is the only thing that will renew my mind. And then what happens when you do this? You, are you showing forth his good, perfect, acceptable will of God? Yes. Now. This was also very interesting. They, had to, they took the sheep, and they were a whole burnt offering. And that's what he's asking us to do, be a living sacrifice and our whole self. 
These were sacrificed on the north side of the altar. Now, it says in Leviticus 1.11, we learned, he shall kill it. He's talking about the burnt offerings on the side of the altar. How? Northward before the Lord. So here we are. We're at the northeast gate. We are born again at the sheep gate. And where do we make ourselves the, uh, the offering? On the north side. Where am I in my journey? I'm on the north side. See, so, now I thought that would, you know, the things that I find in God's word, they just astound me. And then, you know, it, you become more and more convinced as you study, this is the absolute inspired word of God. It is, and uh, you, you f start finding all these little things. He told him in Leviticus, the burnt offering is going to be on the north side of the altar. And where am I in my journey? The, Nehemiah's wall shows us our journey, our Christian journey, starting and ending with Christ. And I am to offer myself a living sacrifice immediately, right? And I'm on the north side. Okay. Now I want to go to Exodus 12. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10 and in Romans 15, does it tell us that everything that happened in the Old Testament is for our admonition and our learning? Yes, so we take those, and most of that is very physical, things that were physically happening, and we apply it in our life. So we're going to Exodus 12, and we're going to the day of the night of Passover and learn from that because Passover is the day that they are going to be taken out of Egypt and released from bondage, right? It's a type of the sheep gate. So here we have... God had given Moses the instructions, and Moses is instructing the people. Jesus Christ, we know, died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm talking our time. I don't want to get into their time because we'll all get confused. So theirs is different. Okay, so for us, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and it was the ninth hour. In the temple, that's when the throat of those sheep were uh, slit at 3 o'clock. So as they are doing that in the temple that day, Jesus Christ gave up his spirit and he was crucified at that time. And what did he say at the ninth hour? It is finished. So what was finished? The plan of redemption. His work is finished. Does there need to be any more blood sacrifice? No. But if you look at the picture on the left, here's what Moses was teaching the people. They're getting ready to be taken out of Egypt, released from bondage. So this is like being justified, right? Because they're going to apply the blood. He told them, you take a lamb and you choose your lamb on day 10. We're in the month of Nisan. And he said, choose your lamb on day 10. You're going to look at it for four days. And you're going to make sure it's spotless without blemish. And then on day 14, he told them they are going to slit the, lamb of, of the throat of the lamb and they are going to take hyssop branches and they are going to apply the blood to the doorpost and lentils of their home, right, of their dwelling. And then when the angel would come that night, the death angel, he would pass over them because the blood had been applied, right? We all understand that. So you can see as the man is doing that, he is giving a picture of the ultimate Lamb of God and what will happen in the, in the future. Now, they, Jesus died at 3 o'clock, and according to them, he had to be off of the cross and buried before 6 p.m. because for them, a new day was starting. Okay? And so now, it's going to be Nisan 15, and they immediately start the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All right? And what is the Feast of Unleavened Bread about? Already, you now start to get the sin out of your life. That's the process of sanctification, right? It's not going to be 50 years later, Francine. It is going to be immediately. And so they're going to have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and we start getting the sin out, and I mean it was almost immediately. Right? Okay. So I'm learning discipleship has to follow the sheep gate, and I think that's where many churches fall down. A lot of churches I've been in, we get people that are born again and saved, but then a lot of the teaching stops, and we don't teach them now how to grow in the Spirit. We don't teach them that so much. And so it kind of falls by the wayside. Sanctification in my life was to begin immediately. 
Now, if we look at Passover, the emphasis wasn't just, oh, God's judgment is passing over you. It was in the death angel being uh, passing over. They were now told, you've got to take your lamb and you're going to prepare it. You're going to eat the flesh and you've got to eat that whole lamb and you're going to have unleavened bread and you've got to use bitter herbs. That was the instructions for them that night. This is so they can be inwardly supplied with everything they need now to fulfill God's purpose in their life. Is he going to take them out of Egypt? Yes, and he's getting ready to take them to make a covenant with them at Mount Sinai and then on to the promised land. But they need to be strengthened inwardly. So eating the lamb. Now, who is the lamb? Jesus Christ. Is he the bread of life? Yes. Are we supposed to eat it totally? He is the word. We eat it all. That's, that's what that significance is. And so they're ready to begin their pilgrim journey uh, after the exodus. So we have some instructions that we can take that Moses gave them and we'll apply it in our life. Now, number one, we know that this lamb represents Jesus Christ, who is the word. He is the bread of life. So we're actually talking about this, right? We're talking about the word of God. They said, number one, the lamb could not be sodden with water. You don't want soppy lamb, okay? Now, what is that to us? We are never to water this down. Ever should the word of God be watered down. David Campbell says a watered down gospel can get a lot of people into your pew, but it won't get anybody to the cross. That's right. And then we have a recipe for theological jello. And he says, you can take God's perfect word here, unchanging, infallible word of God, start mixing a little bit of man's thoughts and opinions in there because we need to make it a little more palatable to people. Then you're standing on theological jello, and that's not worth anything. It says, if we water down the meaning of sin, you know, a lot of people are not wanting to call LGBT stuff sin because God made them that way. When we water down the meaning of sin, we water down the sacrifice which paid for it. It says a watered down gospel is no gospel at all. In Mark 7, 9, here's his scripture. He's talking to them and he says, Full well you are rejecting the commandment of God so you can keep your own traditions. Now we'll find that a lot in different religions. And he says, when you do that, you nullify God's word by your tradition that you've handed down, and you're doing a lot of things like that. You never want man's opinion mixed with this. You don't follow some man and his theology and his teachings. Go to the word of God and see if what he says is here. And if it's not, then you disregard it. So here we have the traditions of men. We have many churches, many denominations, and We have a religion, right? A lot of people following it. I have people that have told me uh, because they're dealing with LGBT in their family or grandchildren and their church is against it. And so in order to feel better, they go find a church that will affirm it. And you'll find them. But church after church, denomination after denomination, walking always in the commandments of men, men putting their thoughts into this. And so what happens They're all going to die and probably end up in hell when you start putting man's opinions in there. 2 Timothy 3.5 says they have a form of godliness, but they deny the the power thereof. And what is my command? Turn away. So people that are going to these churches to affirm whatever they want to be or whatever they want to do or whatever is going on in their family, when they do that, they are disobeying this. I'm commanded to turn away from them. You want to be in a church that is totally preaching God's word. R.A. Torrey says, The Bible has been attacked by many people of great ability and power, and they use all the intellectual, scientific, philosophical, political, and physical forces they could command. Emperors have tried to burn the word of God. Scholars have tried to discredit it, and critics have tried to bury it. The world has tried to ignore it, but it's still the best-selling book of all time. While human governments have fallen, while human philosophies have faltered, the Bible 
stands like a solid rock. So, now they're told the word of God cannot be watered down. You can't have the, the lamb sodden with water. Number two, they have to eat the whole lamb that night. The head, the legs, and all the inward parts. Okay. I'm glad we are talking about this and not the literal lamb. <laughs> okay. We are supposed to feast on the word of God in its entirety. This is not a cafeteria. You've heard that. You know, I can't pick and choose. I have to study the whole counsel of God, the complete word. And first... In 1 Corinthians 1.24, it says, Unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, so we're talking to all of us, Christ is the power of God, and he is the wisdom of God. He's the wisdom of God. We are to feed on the mind of Jesus Christ. And then we go on to Philippians, and it says, Let this mind, here's an imperative command, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And in 1 Corinthians 2, it says, we have the mind of Christ. Now, that is a statement that ought to just blow your mind. And so, many times we can pray, I know the Bible says that I have the mind of Christ. He is wisdom. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and I'm supposed to let that mind be in me, but it's when I surrender to the Holy Spirit and ask him to make that a reality in my life so that I am using the wisdom of Christ in my dealings and in my daily walk. And he says, once again, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. How am I going to be transformed and have the mind of Christ? I have to know this word and saturate myself with it. That's the only way. Now we're going to talk about the legs. So when you talk about eating the legs of the lamb, you're talking about our walk, the way we walk. It says in Colossians 2, 6, How did you receive Jesus Christ? Grace through faith. How am I going to now walk my pilgrim journey? Grace through faith. The same way. All right. Now, it says in Romans 6, 4, you were buried with him through baptism into death. And just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so you should be walking in this new life. We should not see much of signs in our life of our old man. And the more you're on the potter's wheel, the more you're surrendered to him and allowing him to change you, the more you're in this word, there should be less and less and less of the old man. There should be. Now, we will never get to a state where, there, where he doesn't show up some. But we should be sinning less and less. And the fruit of the Spirit should be more evident in our life as we grow and walk. Peter tells us, grow in grace and grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Savior. It says in Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but they're walking how? In the Spirit. Learning to walk in the Spirit is crucial for your sanctification. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, I'm walking by faith, not by sight. So then, and then uh, after three chapters in Ephesians, Paul is telling them all about their wonderful spiritual inheritance. Chapter 4, verse 1, here's his command. Walk worthy of your calling. And you're thinking, how can I do that? How can I walk worthy of my calling? Well, I go back to Joshua. And in Joshua chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, they're getting ready to go across the Jordan River and listen to his instructions about their walk. When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, is that God's presence? That's where he dwelt. And you see the priest of the Levites bearing that ark, you remove from where you are and you go after it. So we're going after the presence of God. And he goes on to say, 
Don't come near unto it so you can know the way by which you must go. Didn't he tell them to keep a distance so they can see and follow? And here's the key, because you have never been this way before. Have we ever walked that Christian walk? We hadn't done it before. So we are to look to him only and let him lead and we follow him. R.A. Torrey says, You may talk about power in your life, but if you neglect the one book that God has given you as the one instrument through which he imparts and exercises his power, you will never have the power of God in your life. This is the key. And many of us neglect it. We don't want to spend time in it. We don't want to study it. It is a discipline. But this is where the power comes from. He says, unless you keep in constant and close association with this one book, the Bible, you will not have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. He says, and if you ever had the power, you will not maintain it except by the daily, earnest, intense study of this book. So is it a choice that we each have to make? It is a choice. Do some people, when we know examples, are there people who seem to walk by faith and in the power of the Holy Spirit for a, a, a long time, and then things come into their life and they, beget, they become neglectful? And can they lose that power in their life? And they're not walking in the Spirit like they were. Daily earnest. R.A. Torrey goes on to say, 99 Christians in every 100 are merely playing at Bible study. Mercy. Therefore, 99 Christians in every 100 are just mere weaklings. Those are his words, not mine. When they could be a giant, both in their Christian life and in their service. That's a quote from Adrian Rogers the other day. Now, we're to feast on the word of God. Is he my life supply so that God's purpose can be fulfilled in me to conform me to the image of Jesus Christ? This book, under the power of the Holy Spirit, is the only way that will take place. I have to feed on Jesus Christ for strength in my daily pilgrim life. Every day it's necessary. He says, stay hungry. Stay hungry for this. And if you're not... I told you about 15 years ago, I prayed that God would give me a, an insatiable appetite for this word. Now, will he answer that prayer? Yeah, because it's his will. Yeah, so if you want an insatiable appetite, you just pray for it. And he will put it in your heart to where this is what you want to do much of your, much of your time. We appropriate the spiritual nourishment of Jesus Christ and then we grow in grace and knowledge and that's what Peter told us to do. Grow in grace and in knowledge. This is one of my favorite passages about what this book will do for me. James 1. If I lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and I receive with meekness. Now remember, meekness is like strength and power under control. I receive with meekness this word implanted in me, it will save my soul. That is a praise God. This word can save my soul. And I'm going to repeat this just for emphasis. We know that we are a three-part person, right? We have a body, soul, and spirit. When I was born again, when I was justified, what happened? My spirit was born again. Is it in my spirit that was dead and could not communicate with, with uh, God? So it, when I'm born again and justified, my spirit's born again. My body is going to be glorified. Praise God. We're going to get a new body. Those things are, are solid. Those are concrete. But right now, what is happening? Being, I'm being saved day after day after day, but it's my soul. My mind, my will, and my emotions, right? So that's the part of me that is being saved day by day. I have a promise that if I receive this with meekness, 
the implanted word in my heart, it will save my soul. Amen. So we have learned Passover was not a campground. You don't take your RV and set up camp now just when you became justified. Where are we going? We, it's a start of a pilgrim journey. We're not supposed to just camp and say, Oh, I'm so glad I'm justified. I'm born again and I'm going to heaven. That's it. And I'm camping right here. No, that's being disobedient because the Feast of Unleavened Bread to begin feasting on the whole word, on the whole lamb, started that night, started almost immediately. So we're going to go to first, no, this is still Exodus 12. He said, this is how you're going to eat it. Now, this is Passover night. Have they been in uh, Egypt for many years? And so he comes to him and says, guess what, we're leaving and he, he's telling them all about slitting this lamb's throat and putting the blood on the door. And he says, and now you've got to eat this thing. Right? So this is all new to them. And so he says, you're going to have your loins girded. Your shoes are going to be on your feet. Your staff has to be in your hand. You're going to eat in haste because this is the Lord's Passover. So there's lots of new instructions that night. And so one of the commentators said, here's how, we're, here's how we are. We're like eating in an airport knowing my flight's almost ready to take off. Okay, so I'm about ready to leave. So this is my attitude while eating Passover. First, he says, I want you to gird up. Now, if you know how the men dressed then, they had a long uh, garment underneath that was called the tunic. And then they usually had a mantle, which was a shorter thing. They wore over that, but they would take the mantle off if they were going to be doing any kind of work or a battle or anything or when they're going into action. So the tunic would be long, but they would take it off for war and work. And they would tuck it into their belt. This is what's called girding up. And they would leave that so their legs would be free. And you cannot have any part of the tunic uh, hanging out. You have to have all of it up and girded. I think I have a picture here in a minute. So if you allow the loose ends to keep dangling, what's going to happen to you in your race? You're going to trip and fall down before you even hardly get started. You've got to be prepared. He says, gird up. You've got to be prepared, be ready to engage in work, battle, and you are in a race now. Yeah, I do have a picture. So here it is, and this shows how they uh, would gird up. <laughs> gird up. Okay. And so down in the bottom right corner, you see where he's finally got it all done. And he has his sword, and he's ready for action. His legs are free so he doesn't get tripped up. Was I in the wrong corner? Okay. I heard some... Okay, never mind. Okay. We're getting ready to depart, and he says, man up, because you're starting a new journey. And what did he say? You've never been this way before, but someone's going to show you the way, and it's important that you watch him. So are all of us in the race of faith the day you became born again? You are in it, whether you knew it or not. And it was quite a while before I really understood what all this meant. Is there a prize that we all are going for? Yes. Now, so now I'm going to 1 Peter. Because in 1 Peter, we have the New Testament instructions about this. And Peter says in 1 Peter 1.13, Gird up your mind to guard your hope. Okay. I'm starting in verse 13. He says, Therefore... Now, you know what we're going to do in a minute. We've got to back up. But verse 13 says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. Hope to the end for the grace that's going to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, to me, that gets a little bit muddy. What am I really uh, reading here? Well, therefore indicates there's a sequence. And I've got to go back and look at what was said before. Because he's telling me to fix my hope completely and hope fully. And so I've got to figure all this out. Therefore, is dependent on all the grace of God that he has been going on about for the last 12 verses. So we're going to back up and look at them. Because the imperatives of Christian living begin with, therefore. Many times in the Bible, you're reading something and then it says, therefore, right? So you always have to go back and see what was there before. 
Peter doesn't begin to exhort you as a Christian pilgrim until he has celebrated the wonders of your salvation in Jesus Christ. So, we're going back up to verse 3. And I think I've outlined them for you. Here's what he wants you to be excited about. God has chosen you. God has caused you to be born again to a living hope. God is keeping an inheritance for you. And it's imperishable. It's undefiled. It is unfading. God is protecting you through faith so you won't lose your inheritance. God is refining your faith by fire so it will one day bring praise and glory and honor before him. He said, look at all this. In this life, you are swimming with strokes of love. You're running this race with faith and joy in Jesus Christ. The prophets and the angels, he said, they're all on tiptoe to see what God's grace is going to do in your life. Therefore, you fix your hope fully in all of this grace he just mentioned for about 10 verses. Everybody with me? Man, now we're fixing our hope. So he says, you gird up the loins of your mind because you're guarding that hope. If you don't gird up the loins of your mind and keep all of this in, in your mind and uh, what all you have in Jesus Christ, you're going to lose hope. So you've got to gird up the loins of your mind to guard your hope. This suggests I'm removing anything from my mind mentally that will be like the pieces of material dangling that would trip me up. Hebrews 12, what does it say? We are to put aside, lay aside everything, Right? In this race, anything that would trip us up, and that's what Peter is talking about. Prepare your mind for action. I'm in this race. There's a prize to be won. There's an enemy. We have so many things to remember, but we're supposed to have a diligent mind. Roll up the sleeves of your mind. If I am all concerned and I become anxious, I become depressed, I'm thinking about the what ifs. What if this happens? What if that happens? And I'm thinking about the culture and I'm thinking about what's going on in the world. I have a lot of things my mind is consumed with, right? Right? Roll up the sleeves of your mind. You've got to guard your hope. And your hope is in Jesus Christ. Prepare to engage in a battle or race. He says in 1 Kings 18, we have an example. You've got to be ready for action. And he girded up his loins. And look what happened when Elijah was focused. Elijah, the hand of the Lord was on him, and he girded up his loins, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. He outran the horses. His, he had girded up. And he was ready because the hand of the Lord was upon him. Then Elisha said to Gehazi, who was his servant, Tuck your cloak into your belt, take my staff in your hand, and run. If you meet anyone, don't greet them. If they greet you, don't answer them. And get there and lay my staff on that boy's face. Was there a task to be done? Yes. Now, this includes, when we talk about girding up the loins of my mind, it includes courage and resolve because the tasks are not always easy. Can some of our tasks bring persecution in our lives? Yeah, even persecution from people in the church. Okay. Now, what does he say in Jeremiah 1.17 to Jeremiah? If you know the life of Jeremiah, he had a rough life. And he was persecuted a lot. In the very beginning, what did God say? Gird up your loin and arise and speak unto them everything I'm commanding you. Do not be dismayed before them, lest I dismay you before them. He was going to have to be bold and stand many times all alone. Now, it also appears to be related to his mental outlook. When you talk about girding up your mind, we go to the book of Job. And what did God say to Job? Gird up your loins like a man. And I'm going to ask you and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. And then we go move to Job 40. And it says, gird up your loins now like a man. I'm going to question you and you tell me the answers. So he says, gird up the loins of your mind. And then he tells him to be sober. This is to be diligent. Remove anything in your life 
that will hinder your spiritual growth and obedience and trip me up. Some of us, we need that. I used to call it a Roto-Rooter session. We need, we need things to get rid of the things that are keeping us from having a successful race in a Christian race. They, we have a lot of things that can trip us up. I need to have a clear, focused mind set on the task before me. What is my task? To be in this word, study it to show myself approved. I'm to be going for the prize. Paul said, I do one thing. And he's going for the prize. And we have to stay focused. That's my task. And to let the Holy Spirit conform me to the image of Jesus Christ. Because I can't do it. And if I don't get on the potter's wheel, it's not going to happen. Because I have to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. I can know this. I can know a lot about this book. But if I'm not surrendered to the Holy Spirit, it, this isn't going to do a whole lot of good that I can say 500 verses. Right? That doesn't matter. I may be able to tell you how to be saved. I may be able to tell you a lot of theological stuff. But if it is not in me, if it is not a living thing in me and I'm not on the potter's wheel, surrendered to him to do with me whatever he needs to, cut away everything from me that's not like Jesus. The power is not going to be in me and the transition or transforming power to turn me into the image of Christ is not going to happen. I don't care how much of this you know. Set me on the task before me and not to become numb with intoxicating influences. In uh, Ephesians 5, I think it's 18, he says, Do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? If I'm going to be controlled by anything, I'm to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Nothing else is to be controlling me at all, only the Holy Spirit. Not my old man for sure. Now, in Luke 12, he says, Let your loins be girded about and your lamps burning and waiting. I'm supposed to be expecting his return. He says, Be ready also, because the Son of Man will come for you at an hour when you think not. And I heard, I think it was, it was some preacher the other day, many of us are saying, Boy, I wish Jesus would come. Well, but are we ready? Yeah, it cannot be I want an escape thing. Because what is, what is right around the corner when Jesus comes for you and me? The judgment seat of Christ. Remember, judgment begins at the house of the Lord. And you and I have a judgment, not for our sin. Don't ever think that. This is for his church, the believers. And that is, we're going to be held accountable for our life. So, yes, I'm, I'm anxious for him to come. But it cannot be an escape thing just because I want out of this culture and this world. Because I also need to be watching and waiting and be ready to stand before him. Now, what does Paul tell, tell us in Titus? You are to be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of your great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am not to be looking for the Antichrist. Although it's interesting to study and, you know, see what's going on. But that's not what I'm looking for. I am looking for the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, if I am looking for his return, that is a great motivation for me to be obedient right now. Because I think there's a parable in there somewhere, I'm not sure where, where the, the guy is... Uh, he is beating his servant and everything because he says, well, my master won't be coming till out there. And so he's living like he wants to because he thinks he's not coming till then. No, our Savior is coming for us, for his bride, his church, at any time. And it is a signless event. And it's very different from the second coming at the uh, end of the seven-year tribulation period. So the conclusion I came to, if I will gird up the loin of my mind, what will, will it correct in me and in my mind? I will not have a real casual attitude about his coming. I want to be ready. So I won't have a casual attitude, and it will prevent me from being caught unaware and unprepared. I mean, you need to wake up every day and say, Jesus could come today, am I ready? He could. Now, so he says, you fix your hope 
fully in God's grace. So what's the object of my hope? The grace of God. That is our, the, our object of hope. Fix your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When he comes for us, does he say his rewards with him? Okay, letter B. Your loins girded and now your shoes have to be on your feet is what he told them in Exodus 12. This is about our walk with God. It's a journey. Watchman Nee says you've got to prepare to take this journey. It is a sojourning way. I am to keep walking, keep moving, making progress. I'm not to settle down. Now, once the blood was applied and the flesh was eaten, did he tell them you are now a sojourner and you're going to leave Egypt? That's exactly what he told them. The blood of the lamb is on the doorpost of my heart now, and am I on a pilgrim journey also? Yes, and I am headed for the promised land, not the promised land, sorry, I am headed for heaven and for my heavenly dwelling place. I'm a, my citizenship is in heaven. So he says, if you're born again, you cannot stay in Egypt. Remember, even when they got in the wilderness and they were whining and they wanted to go back to Egypt, and he says, you will never see this place again. You cannot go back. He would not let them. So let's look in Acts 12. It says, how does the Lord free us from bondage? He says, behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him. We're talking about Peter. And a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side, and he said, wake up, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And here's the angel's instructions to Peter. Gird yourself, put on your sandals, cast your garment about thee, and follow me. See, he's getting ready to go on a journey, and you see this all through the Bible. Gird up, put on your shoes, follow me. So Peter's about to take this journey. You and I were about to take a journey. It says our feet are to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So we are to be prepared. Uh, in this, even in Exodus, you see him like putting on the armor. They're putting on the armor, getting ready for their journey, which we see in Ephesians with Paul. Now remember those hobnail boots that the Roman soldiers wore. It says they were to face the enemy with a firm-footed stability to be prompt in the readiness of the gospel of peace. When, you, when it says your feet are to be shod, it means to bind under yourself, called to action. You're called to action on this journey. Now, you and I will never be successful in spiritual warfare, those battles, if we go out barefooted. We will not be successful. So we're to be prepared, this gospel of peace, to have peace with God. When did I get peace with God? Salvation, thank you, justification. But do I, did I also get the peace of God? The peace of God, I believe, comes with sanctification when you're yielded to him. And he will give that peace in all circumstances. Because many people have been justified, but when the trials and tribulations come, what happens? They fall apart. Where's their peace? The peace is after you're on the potter's wheel and you are surrendered, and then he will give you that peace of God. So this peace is like those hobnailed boots that the soldiers wore so they could stand firm. I know all of you have had trials in your life. Some of us have experienced really deep, dark trials. Without the peace of God in your life, you will not be able to weather the storm. You've got to have on those, those uh, gospel shoes, they call them, the gospel of peace and the peace with God to make you be able to stand firm whatever comes in your life. These, these peace-bringing shoes, you'll have power in warfare. Because I tell you, spiritual warfare can be horrific. And so you'll have power in that. And it's a peace that will prepare your heart for the journey, no matter what God allows in your life. Now, if I have a troubled heart, now I'm born again, but my heart doesn't have the peace of God. I cannot focus on my task because so much of my energy is going to be taken up in steadying or quieting myself. Because what happens? Something major comes into my life, some crisis, and what's happening to me? I'm in anxiety. I'm fearful. 
I'm going into depression. Maybe my blood pressure, something happens with it. All of these kind of things can, were unsteady. The anxiety level. And then we're out to the doctor trying to find something for our anxiety. When I got in this word and I surrendered to him, I didn't need anything outside of this. Because he gave me a peace that passed all understanding even when Laura was in the depths of what she was doing. Here's where your peace comes. On that potter's wheel, surrender to the Holy Spirit and let him give you that peace that passes all understanding. It's available to you if you're his child. Now, they say the steam locomotive is a very imperfect machine because it wastes more power than it utilizes. So many of us possess the power. Is that peace of God available for every believer? It's ours. It's ours all the time. And we possess it, but we do not rest in the peace and tranquility of it. I think many people like to sit and be anxious. Worry about everything. What The what ifs. That is not necessary in our life as a believer. They have a failure to use the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I did for, for much of my life. Because I didn't really understand it. And you have that power. And it's yours. But it's only through your surrender and asking the Holy Spirit to appropriate it in your life. That it happens. So it's like you have all this wonderful stuff. But unless you surrender to the Holy Spirit, it's going to sit there waiting. Waiting for you to ask him to appropriate it in your life. And it become a reality in your life. That we're told to let the peace of Christ rule my heart. That's what I want. And if you don't have it, pray. He will give it to you. Now he'll ask you to get on the potter's wheel. And then that peace will be yours. But it makes me ready for warfare and duty so I can become steadfast and I can become unmovable. And if I've got that troubled heart, I'm going to be tumbled over. Another crisis in my life and I'm tumbled over. You know, I'm just buckled in my knees again. Sudden assaults can work disastrously against us. You have got to be ready for those. Be prepared for them before they come. Be prepared before they come. Now, those gospel shoes will allow me to stand when I face all my difficult circumstances. Here's a great passage for you in Philippi Philippians. The peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And the word guard means garrison, and he will mount guard over your heart. And that peace will be there. So bind on your shoes, it's a call to action. Soak my mind and heart in Jesus Christ and all the fullness of my spiritual life flows from him. You want victory? It all flows from Jesus Christ. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, you're just a jar of clay. Isn't that what we are? Just a jar of dirt. That's basically what we are. And he said, but there's a power in you. And you want people to be able to see that the power in you is you being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's how you can overcome. the. And that light just shines through all your cracks. And a lot of us have a lot of cracks to, for it to shine through. When my vessel is filled with him, people say, man, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that is shining through her, and she's able to, to uh, have victory even in deep, dark circumstances. It's there for all of us. And this promise will be a reality in me from Psalm 121. He says, he won't suffer my foot to be moved. I'll be able to stand even in the midst of those dark trials. Now, he says, now you need your staff in your hand. So we're going to look at our staff the importance of the staff, God made Moses' staff and objects. Listen and underline maybe what all you have in a staff. You have an object of power. You have an object of freedom. Moses' staff was an object of provision for water. Moses' staff was for protection for Israel. 
It provided victory. All of these things were found in the staff. Now, if I raise my staff to the Lord, he's my protector, he's my defender, he works on my behalf, but I continually offer myself to him. And then he works in my behalf. Now, number four, there is someone out there, remember the enemy's right out there on the north. There's someone who wants to steal my staff. Judah's son, Ur, was a wicked man. He was married to Tamar, which was Judah's uh, daughter-in-law. God judged Ur and killed him. The custom was the brother of Ur was now supposed to go lie with the widow to ensure the lineage would be carried on for the deceased man. But Onan, the brother, he did lie with her, but he spilled his seed on the ground. God got angry and he killed him. Now Tamar has no relative to carry on her deceased husband's seed. Judah, her father-in-law, failed to make any provision for her. And she's just a widow and he says, ah, you just remain a widow. So then his own wife dies, and he takes a trip to Timnah with the boys, and they're going to live it up. They're going to a sheep herders festival, actually. So Tamar learns of the trip. She goes out there on the side of the road and poses as a prostitute. Judah comes along, and he propositions her. He doesn't know who it is because she has a veil on to cover herself. Now, I just love this part. What will you give me that you may come into me? And he says, I'm going to give you a young goat. (laughs) That must have been a prized possession. I don't know. But anyway, that's what he was going to give her. And, and she, didn't, she didn't seem to object because she said, bring your goat by tomorrow. And, but she asked for a pledge. I want to make sure you're going to bring it to me and keep your word. Listen to what she wanted. I want your seal. I want your cord. And I want your staff. Those were three things that he should have held on to and never surrendered them. Never, because this was his rank, his honor, and they were of great value. You, he signed over what represented his life, and Tamar now has the goods on him, and it's going to come back to bite him. Satan wants to steal every one of your inheritances. Do you have an inheritance waiting for you? God's keeping it in heaven. It is, it's without blemish, it's perfect, and he wants it for all of us. And I am supposed to gird up the loins of my mind to guard my hope. That's what Peter said, because there's an enemy wanting to steal my inheritance. He wants to destroy God's calling on my life. Jacob, when he was a young boy with Esau, his twin, he was a manipulator and a controller. We all know that. And before his dreaded meeting with Esau, he had a a battle one night with the angel of the Lord who touched him in the hip, remember? And now he has a limp. He now has a staff that represents, our staff represents our dependence on God. That we are willing to depend on him and his staff now helps him walk. Does that help me in my walk when I depend on him? His staff was changed from a symbol of striving and manipulation. God brought him to a place of brokenness. God's brought many of us to a place of brokenness where we finally learn to walk depending on him totally. His name was changed to Israel so he would depend on God. And now he's in the Hall of Faith chapter in Hebrews 11. And it says, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons, and he worshipped because he was leaning on top of his staff, depending on God. Now, you and I can misuse our staff. Moses used his staff inappropriately, and what happened? He was not allowed to even enter the promised land. We must be in total submission to God's ways, or we are misusing our staff. Moses' wrong use of his staff achieved what he wanted. Yeah, he got water out of the rock the second time. But he was judged for that severely. So if I use my staff in a way that God never designed for me, I'm only going to be achieving works of my flesh. And when I show up at the judgment seat of Christ and I am put into the fire to see what my life brings, it'll be a pile of wood, hay, and stubble. And as 2 Corinthians says, I will be there, but saved only as so by fire. And what happened to my inheritance? I've lost it. 
the inheritance. Oswald Chambers says, when you and I depend upon our own strength, it can become a, a splintered staff, and it will create a painful infliction. One little splinter has the ability to cripple you if it's not removed. One little splinter. Our staff, when used through our own strength, can become a source of pain. So what have we seen in today's lesson? I'm on a pilgrim journey. I've just left the sheep gate. And there's towers of fortification that need to be built in my life. I'm to gird up my mind. I'm to bind my feet with the gospel of peace and walk leaning on my staff, depending on the Lord God. I want to look at Psalm 23 before we close. Jesus Christ said at the sheep gate that he's the good shepherd, true? Yes, that was one of the messages. I want to look at Psalm 23. It focuses on what he does for us all the days of our lives. This message is for a mature Christian who has fought battles and carried burdens in their pilgrim journey. So I want us to see, as we look at Psalm 23, we're going to see seven names of God in this psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. He leads me beside those still waters. Jehovah Shalom. He's the Lord, our peace. He restores my soul. Jehovah Rophe, the Lord who heals. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Jehovah Sidkinu, the Lord, our righteousness. You are with me. Jehovah Shama means the Lord is there. The presence of mine enemies. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner. And you anoint my head, Jehovah Makedesh, the Lord, he will sanctify me. That's, you can, you'll read Psalm 23 differently now. And in my Bible, I've even put in the different names of uh, God in each of those sections. So I've, I've given you just a little, I enhanced uh, the top of our map and just told you a few things. And you might add a few things. If you review the lesson, you can put some more things in there. So here I am starting my race at the sheep gate, and I've got these two towers that are before me. And just a few things I jotted down, I've got to follow my shepherd because I've never gone this way before. My enemy is ready and waiting on the north, right? So I've got to keep my eyes on Jesus. He's the only one that knows and can give me a successful walk. I need towers of fortification in the beginning of my journey, I've got to offer myself a living sacrifice because the burnt offerings were on the north side of the altar. So these are things we saw today. And I've got to feed on the word of God and eat the whole lamb. I've got to put on the armor of God. I've got to walk worthy of my calling and be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And I want to end with this prayer. This is a prayer I came upon in Colossians that Paul prayed. And I have kind of personalized it. And I pray this in my life, I would say at least three to four days a week. I do this a lot of mornings before I start studying. So I want to end with this prayer. But I've personalized it a little bit. This is from Colossians 1. So this is our closing prayer. Father, my desire is that I would be filled with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that I would walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, so that I would be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power that works within me, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. And I want to give thanks to the Father who's made me qualified to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. He's delivered me from the power of darkness. He's translated me into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom I have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of my sins. And Father, I just praise you for this truth. May we all desire to be filled with the knowledge of your will, so we can walk worthy of you and be fruitful in every good work. And we give all the praise to Jesus Christ. Amen.
Now, next week, the plan is to go to the fish gate. Maybe we'll make it. <laughs> Y'all have a